All right. So today on Habits and Hustle, we have Strauss Zelnick, who, um, if you don't know who he is, you should definitely listen to this podcast because this guy is probably seriously one of the most impressive people that you'll ever see. The guy is the CEO of Take Two Interactive, uh, the chairman of CBS, just, oh, by the way, on the side, uh, obviously the private equity stress media, right? A ZMC, Zelnick Media Capital. That. He's a former CEO of Fox, and then he left Fox to go run Crystal Dynamics, right? Video game company, right? yeah. And then BMG Entertainment. That's how, yeah. so when I was working at BMG when I was a little girl, I <laughs> knew of you, right? Because I was yeah. living in Toronto, and I just knew there was like this mogul who was the CEO of, was it BMG Entertainment, right? It was. It wasn't Bertelsmann. It was a division of Bertelsmann. It was a division, but you weren't, <clears throat> you weren't at Bertelsmann. You were the head No, I was, the, I was CEO of BMG, the, the, the recorded music division. Absolutely, yeah. And I was just like, wow, one day maybe I can meet him. And here we are. And exactly. <laughs> and then 20 years later. Huge disappointment. Yeah, not <laughs> at all. Not at all. Not a disappointment at all, yeah. which is usually, it's rare, right? Because usually when you meet people, only you... It's kind of like, ah, like it's a letdown, but not this one. So I don't even know. Okay. Oh, yeah. And also an author. He wrote a book called Becoming Ageless, and he's literally the, the fittest CEO probably in the world. Well, it's kind of, it's at least what the publicists say, but I'll, I'll take it. I appreciate it. No, well, it's, it's the truth. So let's start with just the fact that you're 62 years old. And I said to him when I walked in, he looks like he's it's Benjamin Button because he looks like he's 30. And your, I heard that your fitness regimen is like off the chain crazy. So because this is Habits and Hustle, I want to know what you do to stay in such sick shape. So you asked me to tell the truth as opposed I to did. sort of the, the uh, PR version. Yeah, I don't want the and PR version. Because I'm, I, I think the, the problem with answering the question, which I will answer, okay. the way it's posed is the implication is everyone should do what I do and then, you know, they'll be awesome. And I don't really like... I don't believe in that, nor do I give that advice. I think it's really important for everyone to find his or her own, her own level okay. of fitness. And especially if you're not getting exercise now, I think it's really important to start slowly and gently. And I don't recommend to people that they go from sort of a relatively sedentary level to being incredibly intense. That's not the way. It's a way to get injured and a way to reject fitness as opposed to embrace it. You can tell that you have been do you've done this before. You're very <laughs> savvy in media. Great answer. <laughs> So now tell me what you do. So now what do I do? Yeah, I okay. train between, depending on the week, because I'm busy and like we all are, yeah. in a really bad week, no matter how bad the week is, I'll get five workouts of different types. Okay. And in a really great week where I was, you know, had the time and the inclination, I might train as many as 11 or 12 different times. Okay. Each session is between 45 minutes and an hour. Um, if I went out for a four hour bike ride, I'd count that as like two or three workouts. Oh, as you a result. would. Okay. I wouldn't count that as one workout because it, it isn't. It's more than that. But generally, when I'm here in the city, so for example, last week, I had a week that worked out really well. I had 12 workouts. Each, no session was more than an hour. And within those 12, there was a great deal of variety. I'm a big believer in variety. Because right. if you don't do variety, first of all, you get incredibly bored. Secondly, you're going to hurt yourself. Right, so you cross-train. So I cross-train. Right. And, and I cross-train sort of emotionally and intellectually along with physically. Okay, so let's just start with, what time do you wake up in the morning to start? So in the morning, uh, like today, I was up at 5 o'clock. Okay. And I was on my bike in Central Park at 6 a.m. Okay, so what did you do between 5 and 6? I'm a, oh, So that's a great question. I used to, because I wanted to sleep longer, because like, right. I like to sleep, and everyone needs to sleep. I would look at my workout time, which was 6, when mm -hmm. I was meeting my friends to cycle, and I'd roll it back to like the last possible moment where I could get out of bed, you know, brush my right. teeth put on my gear, get on the bike and get outside. And what I found in doing, so maybe I get up 25 minutes before the workout, right. um, which would give me enough time to get organized. And what I found was by cutting it so close, I wasn't really psychologically ready for the workout and I would have to sort of drag my body into it. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't really feel good about the workout till maybe 15, 20 minutes in. And so I, what I realized is for the price of getting up 15 to 30 minutes earlier, I can bring my body and mind along, mm -hmm. and then when I'm finally ready to start exercising, I'm in a much better psychological place. So why do I get up an hour early? I get up, um, I have a, a spiritual moment, I have time to shave if I'm shaving that day, I don't shave every day. Um, <laughs> You're brush shaved my today, teeth. I am shaved today. Yeah. I knew I was gonna see you. No, that's uh, right. And uh, I can um, 
do some email if I want, and I can feel very organized for the day. I can get an espresso, and I can even just sit and, and relax for 10 or 15 minutes, which I sometimes do as I anticipate the workout. Okay, what is a spiritual moment? Are you praying? I'm praying. Oh, you're, yeah, you I'm are? I actually pray in the morning, yeah. Okay, what's your, back, what's your background? Uh, my background's Jewish, but it's not a Jewish tradition. It's you're sort of Jewish? an ecumenical tradition. See, I thought you were German. I am German, but there are German Jews. They are, but I thought you were like, I, I know there are German Jews. Now I sound like a total moron, but I'm going to edit that. No, I won't. I meant like, I thought you were just solely German. No, no, I worked at a German company. But yeah. my, my prayer practice is a very ecumenical, non-denominational prayer practice. Okay. I mean, for many people, it would be, it, it's really a lot like meditation. So it's not like, a, you're not reading the Torah, obviously. Certainly not. Okay, so what do you? What kind of like? What prayer are you doing then? If it's my not from... own, I mean, it's 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 my own sort of spiritual connected, listening, reflective, meditative moment. Are you saying like words? Are you just like humming, or what do you? No, I'm saying words, but they would vary day to day depending on you like, know how like I a mantra. Feel. Not really, more like an expression of gratitude, expressions of. Uh, love and concern for people I care about and an intention for the day. Oh, so you do an intention for the day too? I do, too. yeah. How long have you been doing this for? About eight years. So, because I was going to, I mean, I don't know because I never met you until today. Have you always been like super into like fitness and I've been health? into fitness for a long time, but okay. not always. But I'd say really at this level of intensity for the past 15 years. Oh, okay. But um, I started off, you know, very slowly many years ago. Mm -hmm. And I started getting into fitness in a more serious way in my mid-20s. And then every decade that I aged, I increased <laughs> the volume and the intensity because you need to. I agree. That's, yeah. uh, tell me about it. I know. Mm -hmm. like, we, I, we all look great at 16. I, that's what I always <laughs> say. It's really easy to have like a tight ass and great abs <laughs> when you're like 21. And it right. gets much harder. You've got to work lo much harder for less results, which is kind of really depressing in a way. I don't, I, I mean, not for me, not less results, but you do have to work harder and smarter and with more expertise. Well, with more expertise for yeah. sure. Well, because you also, like, you also lose lean muscle mass as you age, right? You're not necessarily. If you do weight bearing exercise, it, you don't. I was going to say, but right. that's why I always say, like, strength training workout is like having some kind of strength training exercise regimen is much more important than just like hours and hours of cardio. So that's what I was going to say. So you go today, for example, then you go for your bike ride for how long? I was just out for 45 minutes. Okay. And then, then what? Like, do you work out again? Do you I'm go going to work out again when we're done. Really? Okay. Yeah. So like, what are you going to do when I, when we leave? I'm going to work out with a trainer and that'll be some, um, movement work, some weights work, and probably knowing him some cardio work at the end. And that's for an hour? Just shy of an hour, probably 55 minutes. Now do you work out at home? Do you work out? No, at that'll be at a gym. At a, what gym do you? Oh. It's a gym nearby. It's the okay. Harvard Club. I'm very, I'm like so curious. I also work at Equinox. I belong to Equinox. I, I go to Equinox gyms all over the country. Uh, I belong too. to Performix House here in New York. Um, oh, okay. Mendez Boxing, which is a boxing gym. Pure Yoga, which is a yoga gym. You like um, yoga? No, you I are, do, yeah. You're a yoga person. Well, I'm not an expert, but I like it. See, I can't get into it. I feel like I cannot calm my mind. I know they say it's so great for you and blah, 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 but I cannot get no, my- Try hot power yoga then. I've tried it, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm looking at the clock the whole time. Really? Because hot power yoga is really intense and really hard. If you're, I mean, a flow class that's not a heated room for someone who wants yeah. intensity could be boring. When you do it in a hot room, it feels very, very intense. Right, it does. And, um, and so for me, I agree with you. I thought I never liked yoga because I found it slow and dull and mm -hmm. not really exercise. Hot yoga really got me into it more. Also, yoga is really good for recovery. It's good for your mind. It's meditative. It may not be <clears throat> your daily, you know, you may not find it a, a right. daily activity appealing, but, and I don't go daily or even, I don't even go weekly, but I do do yoga now and then. I just find like when you have such limited time, you do have to choose, right? You had to choose what yeah. you like. And I'm like, I'm a hardcore person. So you can see why I like the more. So you like intense. berries. I like berries. I, I do like my, berries too. Berries I, is great. Yeah. Like I love that kind of work. And cause I also feel like I've done something afterwards, you know, like I never like to feel that, Oh God, I spent like an hour and a half. Cause those classes are also like hours long. I mean, like I don't have like two hours to like get there and, and in LA, 
a lot of these the good classes, you got to get there early. You got to do the class for an hour and a half. You got to leave. You're all sweat. It's like it's like a day process. So it's very very difficult. So I'd rather just like do what I like and whatever else. But so do you usually do like a double day, like do two workouts in a day? Like how often would you do that? Well, certainly in a, work, a week where I do 12 workouts, I've done you, a bunch of two-a-days. But sometimes um, you, ca you count, you said, like if you do a four-hour bike ride, that's yeah. two. So that's rare, though. Okay. I would say I do a two-a-day, depending on my schedule, three to four days a week. Okay. So my average week is probably eight to nine workouts. Well, you know what's really funny? Because I, I do take a rest day. You do take one <clears> rest day? I try day. to, yes. And then you don't do anything on that day? I really don't do anything. Like, a lot of people say it's a rest day and they're like, oh, rest day. That means I just lifted weights. It's like, no, that is not a rest day. I take a real rest day. Right. It's, you have to, to recover. You, yeah. Your body needs it. I know. And actually, a lot of experts will say you really should take two rest days. A lot of people mm -hmm. who are in great shape do take two rest days. Absolutely. Um, I, I agree. Also, it's not good for your adrenals. Like you're like yeah. burning yourself out. Yes. Like I'm in the best shape when I actually am not like always going so hard, hard, hard. Totally right. And take some time off. But like. It's more for the mental. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's hard psychologically. Psychologically, it's yeah. very difficult, right? Um, it's funny because we're actually starting to do this uh, this podcast on uh, woodway treadmills starting next week, which mm -hmm. would have been, you would have been great on it because we're not like obviously running and doing this, but you're just walking slowly. But the idea behind it, of course, is like, I really always promote activity and wherever you can get it, you might as well multitask. Mm -hmm. Would have been great if like, of all people, Mr. Fitness over here, I like woodway treadmill. Yeah, they're the, be they're the they best They are the ones. best. I don't run on anything besides that. Yeah. And I'm not just saying that. It, but they are expensive. They are very expensive. They're very expensive. But, they're, but for someone who runs all the time, mm -hmm. and you're pr and I'm prone to a, an ankle injury, it's it's kind of the only thing I... Makes a difference. Makes a major difference yeah. for the shock absorption. The Peloton right. treadmills are great, too. I haven't tried Yeah, that. they're really great. And they're much less costly. Do you have... I don't, those? but I've, I've worked out on them. Do you like Peloton though? Do you do the bikes at home? I actually don't have a Peloton, but oh, okay. um, I've tried the Peloton tread class. Yeah. And my trainer, Andy Spear, is a, a head trainer for their tread offerings. So I've, is I've that your trainer? Him. One of my trainers. Yeah. Doesn't he work at like men's health or men's fitness? He's also a fitness model. Yeah. Oh, he's a fitness model. That's yes. what it is. Right, yeah. right, 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 right. Okay. That's why the name yeah. sounds familiar. Yeah. He's oh. well known. Oh, yeah. Well, I just remember because, yeah. I, I, because I remember seeing him. Uh, okay, so how about your diet? What do you eat? So, I mean, I have the idealized diet, okay. but what I actually eat is mostly healthy diet, but I okay. like sweets. Okay, so. And I do eat some bread. So, you know, uh, my doctor, Peter Atia, will say when asked about a diet, if you want a shortcut <clears throat> to the right diet, uh, stay away from all processed foods, mm -hmm. certainly stay away from processed carbohydrates, uh, stay away from added sugar. Stay away from alcohol. Everything else is fair game. Oh, and no fruit juice. And Obviously. no fruit. How about fruit? Do you drink? Do you eat the fruit? The fruit's fine. So my diet is does include fresh fruit, lots of fresh vegetables, lots of salad, um, lean protein, sometimes not such lean protein, um, a limited amount of whole carbs. But it also includes some bread, some pasta, some sweets, uh, no alcohol, I don't drink. And so I would love to be able to say, you know, I, I, I'm into clean eating, as, you know, mm -hmm. although I find the phrase sort of upsetting because it's like, <laughs> that means if you're eating a regular diet, it's somehow dirty eating. I know, I know. I don't, really, it's like, I don't, I don't think it's very helpful. It's just a, catch but, a catchy way but of it, yeah. I would say the diet, you know, written down, I occasionally keep a food diary. One would say, okay, that's a good healthy diet, except he has dessert a lot. And uh, my justification is I don't drink alcohol, I don't drink fruit juice, I don't drink soda. Um, we have so much in common. <laughs> I obviously don't smoke, but my vice is some sweets. And for me to totally cut that out, um, probably like would be good health-wise and fitness-wise. It's hard, you, you'd be lying if you didn't mm -hmm. say it would be good. But you have to honor and acknowledge the stuff that you like in life. And also you're a human being. I mean, you can't, you know, how do you want to live? You can't be like so, that. A hundred, like, how do you, yeah, exactly. You're so having for a, me anyway, I've made that decision and I don't, but again, I'm not promoting it as like, you should do what I do. Cause if you want me to tell you what you should do is you should have my diet excluding the bread, the pasta and the dessert. Right, we're not, yeah, um, you're not, right. we're not asking you to say, we're just wondering what you do. But what do I do? I, I eat a, what you would consider a normal diet. But what I don't do is I don't eat fast food. I don't eat a lot of fried food. I eat some, but very, very little. Um, and I don't add 
lots of sugar, oil, or butter to things that I eat typically. Who cooks? You or your wife? I cook. You, you do? When you don't I'm have a home, chef? I cook. No. Really? No. Okay, with all these like... I don't, I don't live that way. Uh, well, I would think that you live for sure that way, given like your entire like pedigree of like employment here, but, <laughs> no. but that's a whole other thing. No, I cook. I'm the cook. Really? Yeah. Now, is your wife as healthy as you? She's very healthy, but she uh, she's not focused uh, on health and wellness the way I am. Right. You're like hardcore. Yeah, she's not even softcore. No, <laughs> no. no um, she finds this annoying. So. Does she? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I find it. Like, I love. I, it's I can not her thing, and hours. she finds it vaguely annoying. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Or like, more than vaguely annoying. More than vaguely yeah, annoying. Probably more. Yeah. Do you, so are you not doing any of those intermittent fastings, ketos and all that? So I don't really, I don't believe in keto yeah. as a diet. I think if you want to lose weight. Have you tried it? Um, sure. But if you want to okay. lose weight, sure. Cut out a food group. Right. doesn't matter which one. I, I put, cut out fat, way, you'll lose weight. Cut out protein, you'll lose it's weight. It's not sustainable. Cut, cut out carbs, you'll lose weight. So all a keto diet is, I'm just cutting out most of the carbs in my diet. Are you going to lose weight? Yes. Is it Short term. Su- short term. Is it sustainable? No. Is it a better way to lose weight short term than cutting out fat? Yes. Is it more healthy? Well, the, all the studies about the health of one of these diets, the, the health of the diet is swamped by the fact that the people who go on these diets lose a bunch of weight. Mm-hmm. And so if you're overweight, you're not healthy. And when you become the correct weight or underweight, right. you get a lot more healthy. So even if you're eating too much fat in your diet, mm-hmm. Um, you will be healthier as a light person than as a heavy person. Yes. So what do I, I don't believe in keto diets. I certainly don't believe in the whole 30 at, at all. Right. I, I don't even understand it. I don't know why. A lot of these diets, I I, to be honest, I'm confused still. Yeah, they don't make sense. Right. And, but, like, and then there are certain things you really should do, like have lots of fiber in your diet. Right. It's really, really good for you. And there's evidence that it reduces, you know, markers that are, are bad for your cardiac health, like cholesterol. Exactly. But I think also what happens is there's so much, there's, you're overloaded with information. People yeah. are overloaded. And there's more people obese today than there have been ever. Ever before. Ever before. Like it's a crazy, like 45% of people <clears throat> or 40% of like 40. Americans, 40% of Americans are more obese. And this is with all the different apps and yeah. all the different d- diets and information. And gym memberships. And membership, everything. And, and, and right now, like when I was like, when I started doing this whole fitness thing, which was, I did it because I naturally loved it. But it was like, I was like one of the only ones doing it. It wasn't, it wasn't like the popular cool thing. Now it's become like a very trendy thing. Like, you know, with Soul Cycle becoming a, a major brand and all these other things. And yet look at people are not, it's, not, it's obviously there's a, co- there's a correlation that's not driving somewhere. You yeah. know what I mean? I think it's too much information and people having a little bit of information is very dangerous. Yeah, and people looking for a quick fix. Well, yeah, as or opposed they, to a healthy lifestyle. Or yeah, but I think they do a little bit of this diet and a little bit of that yeah. one. And if you're not following anything like these these trendy fad things exactly, it's going to work. It's going to actually have the opposite effect. You know, um, so that's interesting. So then let's go. We'll come back maybe to that because actually no, I have one more question about that because I actually heard that you started your own fitness like training group. Is that true? Well, I, I, a, a bunch of friends and I started a fitness group in the mornings, okay. and uh, it happened almost unintentionally and organically. But yes, today we have a fitness group here in New York called The Program. The Program. Yeah, that was sort of tongue-in-cheek, and then it stuck. That's funny. So yeah. how often do you guys get together and do that? When, uh, when um, I'm in the city, it's four days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Uh, if I'm traveling, it oh. might be fewer days than that. So if you're not there, it doesn't happen. It does happen, okay. but it happens a little less regularly if I'm not there. Are you like are you like the head coach over there or I'm, the head uh, person? I'm no, I'm not actually. Um, I work with two or three other people in okay. the group to manage it. Wow! So that's also so you'll you'll train with your trainer. You'll bike. You have this thing called the program. Tra- right. You you do hit training on some days. Yep. Right. And when you do hit training, how long do you do it for? 45 minutes to an hour, depending that. on the session. Closer to 45 minutes. Do you Most do that of with a trainer or, or With a trainer okay. um, or with a friend if I'm not okay. in one of the classes. Oh, so you do the classes, okay, yeah. at Equinox or wherever. Uh, Equinox classes, but also the program goes to classes. So the, the program goes, so you guys just do it as a group. We do it as a group, but oh, we go to different places. Like an accountability group, kind it of. It is, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's not. Workout buddies. It's more like a team than it is an accountability oh. thing. Like it's not. People who do it feel like it's 
a lot of them are former varsity athletes mm. and they'll say, wow, I haven't had an experience like that since I was in college when I was on a team. Like a team. That's a really yeah. good idea. I think it's also, it's very motivating. It's to really have. motivating. It's, it's a great atmosphere. It's not competitive. It's very cooperative. Um, there are varying levels of fitness and varying levels of age um, and both men and women. It's a lot of fun. Wow. It's great. And it, that's, I'm going to do that's that. That's what you time. should do. I know. Yeah, I want to do like that, that next time. Yeah. But no, I want to work out one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. I want to see what you're made of, actually. Um, <laughs> You'll be disappointed. I will. <laughs> stop saying that. I, I, there's no way. I mean, <laughs> you're like the op, you're the antithesis of that word. All right. We'll see. It's true. Um, we'll get back to the book in a second. Because I want to, I said to you before we started uh, filming, which, you know, another reason why you're so crazy impressive is you have literally like 9 million jobs that are like, so high level and yet people one of those things would be like uh, would how would someone define their whole entire like professional career so how are you able to be like the chairman of cbs and do take two and your private equity thing just those three alone how are you like, how do you divide the time like are you really good with time management or i think i'm pretty good with time management remember um my my interim chairmanship at CBS is just that it's interim, right? And but I'm still, chairman of the board. I'm not. Um, I'm not an employee of the company, so I'm a right. member of the board. I'm non-executive, so I don't have operating responsibilities there. Right. So you're not, you're not going every day. No, no, of course not. But, and and I don't operate the company. That's what the team does. Um, so but you've been. In, but what does that mean? So what do you do if you're the interim chairman? What does that mean? No, you're you're responsible for convening the board and okay. and running the board meetings and. Uh, and you have a, a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders in that role, but you don't have an operating job. So just to be clear, yeah, it's, no, not, I, it's I not understand. an operating job. They wanted you to take over for Les Moonves. I no, 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 no. I, I mean, I it was saw an reported in the press, but that's not is true. Is that not true? No. Would you have done it? No, I'm, but it wasn't. <laughs> Which you could yeah, do with not offered, other jobs. Not offered, not asked, not interested. You're not no. interested at all. But it, it, it doesn't matter because that was, you know, that was never the deal. But. Um, when ultimately I, I was asked if I was were going to do it, the answer was no. And obviously, now it's been announced that CBS and Viacom are merging, that Bob Backish will be the CEO of the new company. So it's all, it's all moot anyway. Well, how long will you be doing this interim? Until the until the merger. Until is closed. the merger. So when? How long will that be? Uh, I, I, the company, I'm not sure, has said, but relatively soon. Okay, it's still impressive, nevertheless. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for saying no, so. No, it's in you're... terms of the other stuff. Look. Um, ZMC is, is, a, is a holding company in a private equity firm and Take Two Interactive is a public company that has a, an, externally, uh, an external management agreement with ZMC. So it's an unusual structure, mm -hmm. but it really means that ZMC and Take Two go together. They're not at odds with one another. And ZMC is in the business of buying and building and then managing companies. Take Two is a, an entertainment company in the video game business. And I've always found that you know, I'm interested in investing. I'm also interested in operating and I get to do both. So, like, with they can take two. That's obviously Grand Theft Auto. Also, Rockstar is under there too, right? Uh, Grand Theft Auto is a Rockstar, is a Rockstar game. Star Red game. Dead Redemption is a Rockstar game. Coming from take from Two K is NBA Two K. Right. Borderlands, which is Borderlands Three, is about to be released. Bioshock, Civilization, <clears throat> WWE Two K, um, and many other hit titles. And then we have two other divisions: Private Division and Social Point. And it was a ma well, Grand Theft Auto is ma was a massive. It's still it's enormous. Yeah, it's, it's, it's enormous. still a very big. It's still big enormous. Hit. Yeah. But I guess my and forgive me because I'm not like I don't play video games and my kids are probably not old enough. But I, I know what's going on a little bit with the Fortnite and all this. So how does that business with Fortnite and League of Legends and all those does that interfere with the Grand Theft Auto? It's a very different one's individual, one's group, I don't, right? I don't believe so. I don't think that um, that that entertain one particular form of entertainment specifically cannibalizes another. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of room for hits to coexist. And I know a number of people in our business thought that Fortnite directly affected their releases, but we didn't have that experience. At the same time that oh. Fortnite was a big hit, Grand Theft Auto Online was setting records. At the same time that Fortnite was a hit, we launched Red Dead Redemption 2 and it sold 25 million units. Um, it did? Yeah, so we've been doing great despite the success of our competitors. And what I wow. think happens when our competitors have big successes, it just creates more energy around the business mm -hmm. and more consumers come into the market and that benefits all of us who have hits. Yeah, it's true, I guess. So I, I don't see it as a problem at all. And even if it were a problem, what are we gonna do about it? We just have to do the best we can to put out more hits. That's true. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, how, so how did you become, like obviously I said you were 62, but you were the CEO of BMG and the 
uh, CEO and president of Fox. You must have been like 11 years old at that time. Like, you know, when I became um, president of 20th Century Fox, I was 32. How so did you young. even get that job that so young? Well, I'd been president of the largest independent, a company called Vestron, and I'd, I, oh, I I'd made a big hit. I greenlit a big hit, Which Dirty one? Dancing. Oh, I saw that was the I, first picture I ever greenlit. So I saw that you were involved with Dirty Dancing. Yeah. You you greenlit that. Okay, so that put you on a whole new level. I got I and we had a good run at Vestron, and I wanted to move from Vestron oh. to a major studio. And I was given the opportunity when Joe Roth became chairman of mm. Fox, and we had had a previous relationship because he'd produced pictures for Vestron, so we knew one another. Okay, and then uh, Joe and Barry Diller and Rupert Murdoch hired me to be president of the studio. That's young. It was. Yeah, I was young. Trust me, I knew. I knew I was. Were you the youngest ever? Were you the youngest of that of being a student? You know, it's head? a pretty young business, so I'm sure I wasn't. Wow. How yeah. long were you the CEO there? COO. C COO. Sorry. Not, not the CEO. Uh, I was there for four years. And then, but then you went to B. Then you had BMG also, and you were like a little baby. Uh, I was young. I was 36 when I went to BMG. So like you keep on getting these like top tier jobs at like such a young age. What do you think that? What was the reason? Like, what is it about you? I mean, obviously, we know that you're obviously motivated and disciplined, but what do you think were the qualities that kind of led you there, right? Like, well, I was fortunate. I, I, I had a number of opportunities early, that, and each one led to a, another one. I think there's always that intersection of serendipity and, mm -hmm. and capability and hard work. And, I, you know, I, at Fox, it was a, it was a Joe Roth was looking for someone who he could trust, who would run the business side of the operation. And we had known one another and, and I was a good fit. So are you just like a really small, like really good with numbers and operation? <clears throat> obviously you went to Harvard, you have like, I, I saw, I mean, you're no dummy obviously, but I mean, <laughs> I <hope not. laughs> definitely not. But like, is it just like your brain works at a faster pace than the, like the majority of people? Or like, were you always just an overachiever at a young age? Like, no, I mean, I thought I was. I had a very high opinion of my achievements, but I, I actually like, wasn't true. I, the first time I really did well at anything objectively was when I was at Wesleyan, was, which is where I went to college, and I did okay. do very well there. And that was For really undergrad. The, yeah, okay. that was the first time in my life when I actually excelled at something. But previously, no, I hadn't been an overachiever. But I'd always been highly motivated. I was always interested in the entertainment business. And in terms of my skills, it's... Were you an athlete in like high school? No, I was a student. You were very more, academic. Much more than a, yeah, yeah, it really was. And I was creative. I, I was a singer songwriter and I was a writer and I wanted to be a performer. So oh. I was like many people who work in creative industries. Right. I initially thought I'd be on the other side, uh, but I wasn't talented. That was a problem. I, yeah. I was motivated, but not talented. <laughs> right. So, you know, why do I think I've had some measure of success in the business? I hope that I have the ability to crystallize a strategy and, um, Organize a team to pursue it collectively in service of um, in service of greater goals. And those skills, I think, if I you know to drill down, I'd, I'd say that however you define them, I have some leadership skills. I hope I have good communication skills, and I do seem to have the ability to synthesize a lot of information uh, pretty quickly mm -hmm. and arrive at the right conclusion. It's even back um, then, so you kind of were always on that trajectory. Like when you, even though you were on the creative side. You're obviously very academic, and then, but you, but you keep on getting like even it goes, you know. Like I said, I, I think I'm just like dumbfounded because <laughs> every mat, every massive media company, you seem to have like ran. At yeah, not point. quite, but uh, you know, it, it isn't about being facile with numbers. Although you know, obviously, I have to be, I have to know my way around numbers, and I certainly don't think I'm a genius or anything of the sort. And after all, we're not. This is not rocket science. This is entertainment. It isn't. It is entertainment. But the but the operations of it is the operations are complex. It can be complicated. <laughs> yeah, and you have to get things right. Um, I also respect creativity enormously. And if I have if I have a talent, and I'm not sure it's much of a talent, it is identifying talent in other people. Mm, yeah. And bringing out the best in those people, in, encouraging them to work within our system insisting that they pursue their passions, celebrating their success, um, getting out of the way of their work, and then supporting them in whatever way I can. And then we run a very rational, tight, non-chaotic business operation. Right. So you know, we have a very ambitious creative organization led by our creative teams and a very uh, gentle, rational, focused business operation.
Um, and those two things go together well and, and lead to great results. So what do you think makes a really good leader then? I know you said you have great communication skills and you know. Oh God, I hope I didn't put it that way. No, I, but, um, no, I, no you didn't say it like that. Don't you? Mm-hmm. Or you've been, you've been I would great. say listening is part listening. of being a great leader, listening with empathy. Mm-hmm. But certainly having, you have to have a point of view about strategy. You have to understand what success should look like. And then you have to have the ability to gather together an A plus team to build the tactics that support that strategy and then to create incentives so that we all move in the same direction to execute the tactics in service of the strategy and to reach our common goals. And is that that's probably what most people define as leadership. But leadership is not, you know, showing up in a meeting and being charming or charismatic. Right. Leadership is all those building blocks of, you know, working with everyone to say, okay, well, what is it that we're trying to achieve? What what is our strategy to get there? What are the appropriate tactics? Who's going to do that? How do we assemble those teams? How do we pay for it? And now what do we do tomorrow? Do you have a men- Did you have a mentor? Do you have a mentor? I have mentors now. I didn't have mentors when I was younger. I think I was probably too insecure to reach out to people. Really? Yeah, I don't think I had the confidence to go to people who were more successful and say, I need help. I think I felt like I had to do it all on my own. Now, yeah. you know, at this age and stage and for some time, I have no trouble relying on people who are smarter and more experienced than I. And and I do have uh, people I really count on. Who are your mentors? Um, Well, the journal just actually ran a piece on this. Really? Yeah, and they do an article on it. But included among the people I really turn to are Barry Diller, who who was my boss at Fox and who is obviously the very famous entrepreneur in the media business. Really? I don't know who. I've never heard his name. I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, Don Gogel, who is the CEO of Clayton Dubalier and Rice, a big private equity mm-hmm. firm, mm-hmm. but known forever. A wonderful, kind, smart gentleman who's in this space. Um, Michael Dorneman, who's on the board here, who was my boss at BMG. Um, he was the, he was the CEO of Bertelsmann. He was the he was the CEO of Bertelsmann Entertainment, which was RTL and BMG. So he wasn't the overall CEO of Bertelsmann. Who was the overall CEO? Uh, 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 Thomas Middlehoff uh, was for a few years towards the end. So he was at he was at Bertelsmann too. Where's he now? Dornemann. Yeah, Michael Dornemann. Well, he's on the board of Take Two, among other things. But yeah, but you're on the board of CBS, among <laughs> other things. So what does he do also? So he's, does he's, he have 11 jobs too? No, he doesn't have 11 jobs. Okay. He has his own uh, consulting business in oh, the media okay. space. And then Dick Parsons, who was the CEO of Time Warner. Right, I see. And him. he's an old friend and, and uh, primary mentor. So you basically don't hang around any losers, really, is what, it, what, um, what I kind well, of I mean, gather. I, I wouldn't define anyone that way, but um, I'm, I'm fortunate. I, I hang yeah. around with really great people at every stage of life. Do I mean, you, a lot of my friends are really young. Like, I don't just hang around with like old, old uh, other old people. And I, don't, <laughs> I certainly don't define my friends based on their professional achievements. So I have friends of all ages, all walks of life. So do you mentor anybody? I do. It's a big part of what I do. Really? Okay. Yeah. How many people do you mentor? More than you want to know. Like, no, I want to know. The, I want to be act, one of them. The active list is like a couple hundred people. I mean, it's, it's a lot of people. How? Do you, how do I, you do that? I have to find the time for it. It's one of the most important things I do. Do you actually sp- like, fa- like one-on-one yeah. with 200, more than 200 people? Certainly not every week, right? People come and go. But in terms yeah. of the people who I would say over the course of a one and a half year period I would engage with, it's probably around 200 on an ongoing basis. Oh my gosh. And some of them pretty regularly. Some of them not so regularly. Do they, are, they, are they people who've all reached out to you or did you, like how? Yeah, they've, I mean, I certainly don't reach out to them. Well, no, I have an idea I'm like, to mentor you. But what I'm, no, no, what I mean is like maybe you like, it was like friend of a friend or yeah, whatever. Yeah, it could be, can be anything. So, can, so like, I want you to mentor me. There we go. So, maybe not, maybe not on camera. Maybe not on camera, <laughs> that's fine. But like 201 then you'll have. There we go. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe you have time to do all that. That does take time. I often, I mean, first of all, I bring a lot of people who I coach uh, and and try to help to the gym with me. So, so that's right. You're double. You're I love meetings in the yeah. gym. Part of it, but I do a lot I on the too. phone. Do mm-hmm. a lot on the phone. Sometimes on the weekends. And also, there are people who don't want to go to the gym. I don't drag people to the gym of no interest. So it could be a meeting in the office. So then, um, when were you on the cover of then men's? Men's, men's fitness. fitness, yes. About six years ago. Oh, that was six years ago. Mm-hmm. Did you get ready for that co- the, the cover? Because you were pretty ripped, though. And I think I'm in better shape. I'm certain I'm in better shape now because my goal to be in better shape every year than the prior year. Um, yeah. I didn't, 
I'm sure I did some prepping for the cover, but I don't do anything insane. If I'm going to do it, like there's a picture of me shirtless in Becoming Ageless. Yeah. And did I do some prepping for that? Sure. You know, but it's not Photoshopped. It's lit. It's lit very right. nicely. It's, it's all about it's, the lighting and it the It is angles. lit for sure. And exactly the lighting and the angles. But um, I don't do a, a kind of crazy prep, you know, the prep where, because yeah. I know what that prep is like. And I've prepped people, believe it or not, for shoots and for the movies, friends. Really? Because I know how to do it. But I didn't do okay, that. Okay, how do you know? How do you know? Like, how do, tell me how you'd prep somebody. What would be the prep? Um, the prep is starts around, I mean, you can't take someone who's terribly, terribly out of no, shape no, and no. make them look good. But if, about two weeks before you would start, and it's, it's all diet. Um, mm -hmm, and you have them drink over a gallon of water a day, starting about two weeks before. And obviously you cut calories and right. you cut a lot of carbs out. And then by 10 days before, you're really kind of super carb light. You're eating you know, boneless, skinless, steamed chicken and broccoli mm -hmm. and limited amount of anything that has sugar in it. Um, right. And you're very calorie light, very water heavy. Um, then about three days before you taper down the water to about half, two days before even you taper it down even more. And then a day before you eat a bunch of carbs and, uh, the morning of, you know, you have a donut and, um, That's right. some water and you know, you'll look great. You should be like a, what do you call it, a bikini pro coach. Yeah. So that by the way, like none it. of that, none of that's particularly healthy. No, it's and, terrible. And, also and I don't move. recommend it. Yeah. And I don't recommend it. A and B, it strikes me as silly. And I didn't do anything like that for the book. All I did no. for the book was, um, you know, I probably tightened up my diet, cut down some sweets mm -hmm. and the like for a week, knowing me mm -hmm. 10 days. And I probably did have a bunch of water and then cut some water. I definitely did that because that's relatively easy. Do you take any supplements? Or? No. I mean, I, I take some medication that my doctor recommends. Oh, okay. Um, I don't take supplements. I don't really believe in them. Right. Protein, if you need protein in your diet, you certainly could have 100% whey protein, no added sugar. You know, there's no reason to have added stuff in it. I don't drink caffeine anymore, but caffeine can enhance your workouts. And so you I don't, don't you don't not even that espresso you said you I, have? I drink decaf espresso. I don't have any complaints really? with caffeine, but I, I have high blood pressure just systemically. Oh, okay. So if you have high blood pressure, you really shouldn't have caffeine because it just makes yeah. it worse. But I have no quarrel with caffeine and caffeine is a good pre-workout. Yeah, I know. That's in all what the pre-workouts, mm -hmm. no problem as long as you don't have high blood pressure. Protein is fine. Um, other than that, the, the, you know, the science says that most of what you're going to find in supplements is not going to do anything for you. Yeah, no, I, I and certainly I don't believe in anything off market, illegal and not scientifically tested. Right. And I do not believe in, you know, steroid stacks and the like. Right. Um, if, if you're in the bodybuilding community, you're in that world. That's just a fact. Um, it is not healthy. No, I, 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 I agree with you. It's just not healthy. Do you, so you're what, taking a terrible risk. I, I, I agree. And I think that, but you know what? I think that people are, that, that information of course is out there. And then people of course think that's a shortcut and it's not, not, it's a shortcut to, to nothing because right. it, it will backfire, yeah. you know, just like a lot of these fad diets. Do you have a, a night routine? Do you go to bed exceptionally early? What do you do? I, I think you should try to get you know, seven or eight hours of sleep. Because of my schedule, I don't typically get that much sleep. I get between six and seven. That's not quite enough for me. I'll take a nap on the weekends, try to get a little bit more. Mm. I don't believe in short sleeping unless you're truly a short sleeper. Only about 1% of the population really, you know, are yeah, short no, sleepers. Um, but you should be trying to get eight hours of sleep a night well, if sleep, you can. Well, sleep is one of the pillars of, of wellness and health. Unquestionably. You know? I'm also a big believer in sleep hygiene. So... A sleep what? Hygiene. So sleep. darkened room, oh, okay. the right temperature, um, a comfortable bed. Am I sleeping with a clean person? <laughs> no, no. Having like one of the things that people, I never did this before. I, I kept the blinds up because it was obviously dark when right. I went to bed and I get up early in the morning. But I live in New York City. There are lots of, there's lots of ambient yeah. light. So now my wife and I keep the blinds down. The room is quite dark. You'll sleep better in a darkened room. Yeah. And a cool room too. And I don't keep my phone near my bed and I try not to be on a screen before I go to bed. Really? For how long before you go to bed? I don't really have a, I don't have a time constraint, but you know, most people feel like an hour before you go to bed. But basically I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to be highly stimulated by work mm -hmm. or even by entertainment before I want to go to sleep. Do you, do you um, have any habits that are very specific to you that you do every day besides the exercising? Well, I mentioned you know? that I pray in the morning. And mornings. the praying, right? We got um, that. Are there any other habits? 
Not really. I would say, you know, exercise for sure, daily prayer. Do you watch TV? No. You don't have, no? I mean, very little. There's not one show that you like. Uh, no, there are shows I like because, you know, my wife likes to watch television and she'll right. point to stuff. And I am chairman of a television network, so well, I watch, watch those but shows. But you really but don't I, do anything with them. It's basically just like a, a nuisance on the side. I don't regularly watch a lot of television, not because I have anything against it. I'm in the television business at CMC right. as well. Um, but it's a matter of your, your time. And right. Um, it is not realistic to exercise a lot, have a wife, have kids, right. have a bunch of jobs, mentor people, read, and also to watch lots of entertainment. That was, that was my next question. So do you ever read? Like just I do read. Fun. I mean, I obviously read news during the day. And then I, I try to be reading a book at any given time, although oh. I don't have a book right now. I was going to say, what's the book? I have you're... a book that I'm about to read, but um, I haven't started it yet. Which so book? I really, it's the Richard Holbrook biography that everyone says is great Oh, okay. by George Packer, but I haven't started it yet, so I can't recommend it. But what was the last book you read? The last book I read, um, I've forgotten actually the one I just finished before this. The last book I read that I thought was really great was... Um, American Kingpin about the founder of the Silk Road, which is a great read. And it's oh, very okay. cinematic. It's like watching a television show. Oh, yes. Yeah, like by same Nick thing. Bilton. That's good. Do you prefer, if you watch a comedy person, are you a drama person? Are you like an action person? For like if I'm watching a movie? Yes. Or any of them. Any of them? Yeah. So, I like dumb comedies. So who's your favorite? Like since you're in the entertainment space, <laughs> who's like, who's like, a, who's your favorite actor? So given that I am sort of in this business with a lot of talented people. You can say I'm, one of your, okay, who's I, one of your favorites? I think I'm probably not going to go there, but. You won't even say one of your favorites? No, I think I'm going to leave that one alone. I thought that's very like, that's a very. There's like, so many that are my favorites. They're all my favorites. They're all your favorites as a kid. You know, which one is your favorite? They're all my favorites. That's, people ask me what my favorite video game is. It's like, ah, I don't think I was so. Gonna, do you I play video them. games? I do not. No. Do your kids play video games? Yeah. They're not avid gamers, but they play. Uh, how old are your kids? 26, 24, and 21. Oh, wow. So yeah. they're in college and past college. Uh, yeah, exactly. Are they in the entertainment world too? My or? middle kid works at Viacom. He's in the entertainment world. Oh, in which area? Corporate development. Oh, okay. And the other two? Nope. They're not in, They're not doing anything entertainment-wise? Correct. But they finished school? My daughter's still in school. Did they go to Harvard too? No, no Harvard kids. No, no Harvard no. kids. Okay. At least not yet. Not yet, right. <laughs> Maybe soon. You never know. Okay, of all these big jobs, which one was like, which which... Um, genre do you love the best? Do you like music? Do you like the TV, uh, movies, uh, video games? I mean, they've all been great along the way. Um, I really do love the video game business, but I'm probably saying that because it's what I'm active in now. Yeah, doing it now. Um, I loved the music business because I had been a musician. Right, you said and, that. And music really resonates with me. And it was a really fun business when I was in it. Movies were really challenging. Uh, I love motion pictures. Being in the movie business is really hard. It's a tough asset class. Right. And I used to say, uh, you know, my boss got to say yes 25 times a year. I got to say no 10,000 times a year. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's such a good one. That's so true, So that was right? the movie business. Uh, and then eventually I got to be the guy who could say yes 25 times a year. But um, that was hard. You know, you were, as, as head of a studio, you're delivering no's to people who it's their dream. It's their whole life, right? And much less so in the recorded music business where you put out a lot of product. And much less so in the video game business because the creativity in the video game business exists in-house. Mm -hmm. So in the movie business, you're taking outside pitches all day long, right. most of which will never get made. Even the ones you say yes to and then put in the will never get made. And then they just go uh, sit on the shelf for... So that's not true in the video game business. Our pitches are internal. And the, the vast preponderance of our internal discussions will go to prototype them. You know, if, if we have a team at one of our labels and they're really excited about doing something, then we have the resources to back them to do that. But they're not, we're not, I'm, this office is not, you know, I know a long line of people coming in to have a great idea for a I video know. game because it's not how video games are made. So I, I have to admit, I like um, that we don't, I don't have that activity here as part of my daily brief. I also love the fact that of all the businesses I've been in, video games are the most rapidly growing. So you have all these industry tailwinds. And anytime you have tailwinds, it means you can afford to take bigger risks. Mm -hmm. And when you take those risks, more often than not, things that work out, you know, at least so-so. Right. Because the business is growing behind and around you. Isn't there more money in the video game world now than, because, than the movie yeah, it's business? it's a huge business. It's a huge business. I mean, because you're selling, you're selling 25 units of something. Million. Mi yeah. I mean, sorry, 25 million units. And then... Like with movies, obviously, like 
it's all I feel like now with the movie business it's all like Marvel it's all the same movies that they've done like six or seven ten times you know I think that's an overstatement we some of the big hits are obviously things that we've heard of but we make sequels in video games as well and also in the movie business you know people try new things every year a lot of that you'll find mm -hmm. that at festivals right um, the festivals so yeah. I don't think the movie business is any more or less sort of commercially oriented than it has been for a very long time but of course the biggest hits are what you would expect they're they're either new intellectual properties that you've never seen before but that are just awesome right. and blow you away or their sequels to beloved franchises and that's true of many businesses it's true of the video game business too out of the 25 that you said that you greenlit name name me five other ones that I would know well when I was at Fox our team made um, the abyss sleeping with the enemy home alone die hard 2 um, Many, many, many. Hits. Which ones did you say no to that became like massive hits? <laughs> oh, there. So not many. Okay. But the the when I was at Vestron, so not Fox. Okay. Um, we had a picture in development that was um, it was the title of the script was Three Thousand, and it was a very oh. misogynistic oh. picture about a about a prostitute and a rich guy in Los Angeles, and it ends. The ending of the picture actually was. Hit the, the guy opening up the door of his limo and pushing her out into a gutter. And Pretty we, woman was like that? No. So you figured it out. So I, I finished it. reading the script and I said, over my dead body will this picture ever get made here at Vestron? And we passed on it. And the, they took the picture to Disney and Jeff Katzenberg and his team reconceived of that as a comedy right. called Pretty Woman and had it rewritten as a comedy and a sort of Pygmalion comedy and obviously it was a massive hit. So to say that I didn't have any vision for it is an understatement. That's the one that got away, but it didn't really get away it because didn't. it was a dark. They changed it. Was a it. dark melodrama. Well, I mean, they changed it because they had the talent to figure out how to change it, but I did not. So that's one oh, that I really, I really, really missed. That's a big um, one too. And and the worst part is I literally did say, "Over my dead body, will this get made here?" And it's like. Mm. And then that's like the, it's like a yeah massive hit. One yeah. of my favorites. Yeah. Is there anything else that's the only movie that's ever that's ever? I mean, happened it doesn't. To? The movie business doesn't tend to. You know, it, it isn't typical that you will take a pitch, and turn it down, and in that form, it will be made elsewhere and turn into a hit. Because remember, what's tip, what typically happens is, all pitches die. Mm -hmm. You know, you're thousands of pitches turn into development projects, none of which ever gets made. So it's very rare that you would be an executive at one studio and you would have something pitched, you would turn it down, it would go elsewhere, it would be developed, it would be made, and it would turn into a hit. I mean, you're so, the odds of that happening are very, very slim. So then something like at a BMG Entertainment when you're in the music world, like I think a lot of people don't really understand how, like the, you have labels within labels and deals, like Jive was under BMG, mm -hmm. RCA was under BMG. I know you gotta get out of here. No, yeah. it's okay, I okay. just wanna check. Okay, um, how much time do we have before I gotta like let Strauss out of here? About 10 minutes. Oh, no okay, more. okay. Um, okay, so basically, so how you have like labels and subsidiaries, how does it work though? Like at your level, how, what are you doing? Such a great question. I'm fond of saying I'm not sure much work goes on in the corner <laughs> office, but I, look, I think what I'm doing is what I described earlier, which is hopefully um, helping everyone agree on a common uh, mission, vision, goal set, strategy, culture, set of tactics, um, incentives, uh, and outcomes. Are you okay in the deal? And then, you know, then we have daily execution and I'll weigh in on stuff that is important for me to weigh in on. But like, for example, like, you know, like, Jive, let's just say Jive, because remember Britney Spears was on Jive? I or, do. And NSYNC or, whoever, like, yeah. or RCA. Okay, so what was the RCA deal? RCA and Jive are different labels. I know, okay. I'm saying RCA, I don't remember who was on who. Jive and NSYNC was... went to, ultimately went to Jive, yeah. Right, so let's just started, say Jive. Started at RCA Germany. Right, right. so they had, yeah. okay, so it was BMG, I'm sorry, had the deal with Jive, which had Britney Spears and NSYNC. So did you do that deal? Would, would it be like you did the deal with BMG to have that relationship or? What, the Jive relationship already existed when I got to BMG, but I renewed that relationship, I think twice while I was there. And so are you, so are they working as a separate entity? They like, were definitely a separate entity. So you're not signing any talent to anybody is my question. You're not signing talent. You're not. Personally? Per, no, not, yeah, but like at your level, you don't, no, you're I mean, only I, overseeing I would, I would, everything. I would have a relationship with certain, right. certain people who were, who were um, you know, talented people who worked with us. But no, I didn't typically bring talent into the company, maybe right. very, very occasionally. 
I'm just curious because you said you had that like you all you were a musician. And yeah, but I wasn't an A and R. The A and R group reported to me. I know, but yeah. because you had like a, a powerful position, I would think that maybe you can like you know. This weave is why it's way. good that I don't play video games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it would, <laughs> not my job, right? Yeah. It was the job of the the label heads and the A and R teams, and I think. You know, I was not a seasoned, capable A&R executive. Everyone's got a point of view. Right. There's that line. Um, everyone has two businesses, their own business and show business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So naturally, I could have decided I would be a great A&R executive. But I don't think that's the job of the head of the label group, as I define the job right. for me. Now, someone like Doug Morris, who was a, a record man, or Clive Davis, yeah. who was a record man, Doug ran a big group. He ran the overall label. But he, was a, he had a background in recorded music. And I could imagine that he would weigh in on acts and actually decide yay or nay. But I rarely would be involved in decisions like that. It's not what I did. Um, and it, it's not what I do here. It's not what I did at Fox. Right. As I said, what, what I do, if I, if I have a facility for anything, it's finding the talented people who do that really well. It's one of the reasons I don't take credit for any of the hits I've been involved with, because I didn't make them and I didn't choose them. I really, I don't deserve any credit for them, genuinely. I'm. If I deserve credit, it's that I had the presence of mind, structure the company appropriately, and bring on board the most talented people in, in the world. And then I, I help them express that talent. Maybe I deserve some credit for that, but the hits don't belong to me. Okay. And knowing that about myself is powerful. And what happens often is people get in positions of power where they could decide to do whatever they want. And suddenly they decide, well, it'd be really cool. I should go, like I should go sign someone because mm -hmm. then then they'll thank me at the Grammy Awards. It's like, no, 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 I don't do that. Right. It's not that's, what I do. It's ego. That's more, e yeah. So I try to keep ego out of it yeah. as much as possible. And, um, you know, the, the, the more I'm willing to sit in the backseat and not get the press and not get the accolades, the more successful we as an organization will be. And I'm good with that. I don't, you know, at the end of the day, the CEO gets altogether too much credit as it is. I certainly shouldn't get what I get, never mind more. Wow. Okay. What do you think of social media and entertainment? Like, huh. what, what do you think of that whole? Look, I mean, we, we in the entertainment business rely on social media for marketing and for engagement and excitement. Uh, the part of social media, I would say, like least is, you know, the haters. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that it's like an otherwise polite person gets behind the wheel of a car with all the windows rolled up. And next thing you know, they're <laughs> screaming and, and, and flipping people off. And I sort of feel like social media is like a car with the windows rolled yeah, up. Yeah, it's so and true. And suddenly people feel empowered to do and say things that they would never do interpersonally. And I don't know that we're benefited from, you know, the ability in, you know, in 146 characters to insult someone with no information. And I don't think that has served us politically. I don't think it served us uh, from a marketing point of view. But it's hard to complain when... You know, we rely on social media for our marketing. So I'm not complaining. We're part of this world and we right. benefit from it. But I would observe that the, the voices of the, the, the haters can be amplified. And that's before you even get to manipulations, you know, foreign governments using our mm -hmm. social media or bad actors using social media to target people they're competitive with or right. don't like. And um, But it impacts, I feel, like the, your, the space of entertainment because now I feel... People are, are getting television deals or movie deals not uh, based on their numbers on social media. It's becoming the new medium to make a celebrity or a famous person. You can. Right? Yeah. Versus like the old school way, right? Yeah. So it's all based on this other... That's, uh, that's why I was kind of curious what you thought of that. Like, do you find that's going to be happening more? Or is it... No, be, I think there'll be a backlash. Do you think there'll be a backlash? I do. Yeah. Why do you say so? I just sort of feel like, you know... Andy Warhol's tongue-in-cheek comment that, you know, in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes mm -hmm. has come, and it will go. And yeah. I, think, I think eventually we're going to go back to a world where celebrity is not enough, notoriety is not enough, talent is required. Right. But talent also, like, you look at all the shows like American Idol, The Voice, all the other. I'm watching your clock. Don't worry. I got, mm -hmm. like, six minutes. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're trying to create stars off of these platforms or these, like, or these talent shows, Right. And then you have all these millions of people who are watching. And then the idea was like you have those eyeballs on you and they're going to go on. But I haven't seen really anybody so far become like a, a breakout hit except for the first season of American Idol with like so there Kelly Clarkson. Some, there have been, I mean, I don't have the names to tip my tongue. There have yeah. been some pretty big stars. But, you Ooh, know. Besides like Kelly Clarkson. Yeah, I don't, or, I don't even know. But there have been. A few other careers ones. Careers have been built. 
Um, a few from American Idol, the first couple I, of years. I, I sort of feel like a blonde girl too. The, um, as I said, I think notoriety shouldn't just be enough. How about a little talent? I agree, but that's that's more that that's a very. I agree with you on a much more of a uh, on like a deeper level. But unfortunately, the world that we live in, I feel like people are getting opportunities based on social media. Yeah, I right? wonder if that'll change. I'm just hope I'm hoping it changes. Yeah, I do you think, think it may. do you think it's going to have that backlash? I do. Yeah. When my experience in life and certainly in entertainment is everything that becomes conventional wisdom always changes. Okay. Exactly when you think that's the way it's going to be, that's when it changes. When do you think it's going to happen? Oh, well, if I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, okay, one more when thing. When least expected. Yeah, right, yeah. when you're least expected. Okay. Um, what, one more thing, and then I'll, I'll let you out of here to go work out with Andy. or That's right. Man. Andy's next. Andy. Um, what's your next step? I mean... Take two. Do you have anything like? Are you going to write a new book? Are you going to? Be I don't doing... have another book planned right now. Um, I think. I think right now, having been really busy for the past year and a half between the book and or sixty-two years, <laughs> bunch of bunch of other jobs. Um, I think it's a good time to focus on what's on my plate now and build ZMC, build Take Two, and um, I'll stay open-minded. But I'm. I've, I'm reasonably busy right now. Right. I'll keep it this way. So, you don't, so, so as of now, you're just going to be content doing what you're doing. I think that's right. All right. Well, I think that's good. I, I don't think we can keep you any longer. I think thank you. Andy's waiting. So thank you so much for doing this podcast. My thank you for having me. No, I enjoyed it. You're an, an excellent guest. And how do people find you on social media if they want to know more about yeah, you? Yeah, well, the program <laughs> is on Instagram. It's uh, the program underscore NYC. Oh, right. And I'm on Instagram, just under Strauss Elnick. And I'm on Twitter, also under Strauss Elnick. Are you one of the people that has the car rolled, the windows rolled up in the car on Twitter? No, I'm polite. Yeah, I, I try to so. be polite at all times. You seem very, you, very humble and very <laughs> polite. You're, you made a great impression. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Bye. Habits and hustle, time to get it rolling. Stay up on the grind, don't stop, keep it going. Habits and hustle from nothing into something. All out, hosted by Jennifer Cohen. Visionaries, tune in, you can get to know them. Be inspired, this is your moment. Excuses, we ain't having that. The Habits and Hustle Podcast, powered by Habit Nest.